no one, no parent, no parent has perfect children. In fact, every parent has disobedient children. And God, even God the Father, some of you will be surprised to hear this, but even God, the perfect Father, the Father of all fathers, only had one perfect son. Every other one of his children are disobedient, are imperfect. That's you and I. That's every Christian that we know. Some of us are surprised to hear that God has got, God's got kids that aren't perfect. Yes. That's you and I. Welcome to the club. We're going to be looking at Exodus 32 this morning. And if you need a Bible, please raise your hand and Zach's going to bring those around. Exodus 32 is where we see, we get a glimpse. Now, we've seen it already, but we'll get a very clear, very good glimpse. Uh, not even necessarily a glimpse. We're going to see just how sinful, how disobedient, how wicked his people, God's children, can be. You and I know this to be true because you and I oftentimes can be so sinful as we struggle through this life. We can, we can go after things that we ought not be involved in, even as God's children. Exodus 32 has two main divisions. Two main divisions. The first is the golden calf, which we will see in the first six verses. The golden calf. And then something that you and I do not often come across or talk about God's wrath. So we'll see the golden calf and then the God of wrath as we get into the second part of it. The golden calf, let's take a look at this beginning in verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. There is a definite... Um, what we might say air or general, general uh, um, you, you can see it here, general idea of, of time. Notice in verse 1, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. So the first thing that we see about these people, about God's people, is that they are impatient. You and I are very familiar with being impatient. All of us are impatient about different things. It might be going to get fast food. That's not so fast. Yeah. And you go, what are they doing in there? It's been made for like six hours. It's been under a heat lamp. Just grab it, put it in a bag, forget the bag, just give it to me. We can grow so impatient. For some of us, it's those... For some of us, it's those... It's that dish of macaroni and cheese. Microwavable. It says instant on the package. It's not instant. I had to put it in for five minutes, stir it up, put it back in for another three. This is not instant, and we can grow so impatient. For some of us, it's with family members. Oh, my gosh. What takes you so long in there? I'm going to the bathroom. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. I got to get in there. My brush is in there, or my hair gel is in there, or my toothbrush is in there. It's getting all stinky. We can grow so impatient with people. And, and God's, the, the children of Israel, God's people at this time, though they're following God, they've got Moses leading them. They see a pillar of cloud during the day, and they see the pillar of fire at night. They see, they're, they're watching what God has done. They've seen all of the plagues that God brought about on the Egyptians, that all these people were there. And now they're looking and they're going, Moses has been gone for a long time. And it's believed that he's been up on the mountain meeting with God for about 40 days. And they're going, man, he's been gone so long. And, and so there is this impatience here. And I want you to see what impatience does. Verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down, he didn't delay. God's talking to him. You don't just leave. It's not like he's up there thinking, oh, I really don't want to go back down to those people. I'm going to see how long can this take. It's God's talking to them. But here's what happens, is that when they grow impatient, look what they say. They say to, the, the people gather together and they say to Aaron, they said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. Impatience oftentimes will awaken sinful desires within us. 
These people do not see Moses. They say he's taken too long. He's been gone for too long. I think the guy went up to meet with God and then just kept going and he's gone. I don't know where he's at. And when they grow impatient waiting for Moses, sinful desires are awakened within them. And the first place that they go to is, come make us gods that shall go before us. Make us gods. Now, this is known as the golden calf incident. They're going to make a golden calf, which we'll get to in a few moments. But let me ask you a question. Why do you think the people, when they said, hey, our leader is gone, we've forgotten all that God did for us, let's make a golden calf. Why do you think they immediately went to the golden calf? Noah? Yes. Tangible, right? They wanted something tangible. Something tangible. Something to add? I was also seen as like holy images in some religions and cultures. Like maybe where? Aren't they? I don't remember exactly, but they're seen as like reincarnated humans. Okay. Yes, they are. You're right. Yep. India. Modern day India. Yep. And where else? Egypt. Egypt. Oh, that's right. These people have come out of Egypt where they saw images and statues and idols and so-called gods for everything, for the cattle, for insects, for the moon, for the sky, for the river, for the dust, everything. So when they grow impatient, they revert back to what they were familiar with prior to. Impatience will oftentimes cause the sinful desires to awaken. Where I feel the need, like I, I, I'm, I've grown impatient, and I feel the need to go back to what I previously knew. Forget all that God has done. He did all of those things, but forget all of that because he's not coming through now when I really need him. So I need to do what? I need to come up with my own solution. And that, that's the second thing. Impatience oftentimes will cause those sinful desires to be awakened, but it will also cause a sense of hopelessness. Look at it in verse 1. Come, make us gods. There's the sinful desires. They want an idol. But what happens after that? That shall go before us. We need a leader. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. He's gone. We've got no leader. And oftentimes that impatience will cause us to try to handle the problem on our own, to come up with our own solution. And it might be in something small and silly, like... This microwave instant mac and cheese is not really instant. I need to come up with my own solution. And you end up melting the package or burning up the microwave or stinking up the whole kitchen. Or then maybe it's the entire house. Or it might be something bigger than that. I'm at the fast food place. I thought it was fast food and maybe, maybe your mouth, you have no control of it because of your impatience and you say something to the employee that's hurtful or cutting. Or you cause some problems in that way. Or maybe it's with a family member that you grow impatient with. And then you lash out at them and do something. You take the matter into your own hands because of your impatience, because of my impatience. I'm speaking out of, this is an area of expertise for me. I am an expert at being impatient. The microwavable food just is never quite fast enough. I don't understand. Why does it have to take so long? It says modern machinery here. And I can grow so impatient. I can grow impatient with people. All of those areas that we talked about, I am guilty of. Impatience can lead us to do these things. And what happens in verse 2 is we see this. We see that not only the impatience, but also the idolatry. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears. Check this out. Which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Like what? They all had their ears pierced? And my dad says I can't pierce my ears? Ah. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Now keep in mind, this is Aaron saying, okay, you want a God? I'll tell you what to do. Bring me all of your golden earrings. Break them out of your ear and bring them here. 
And then Aaron collects them all in verse 3. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Who made the molded calf? Somebody. Yes. Who made, that's right. Who made the golden calf? Church, help me out. You got to wake up. Who made the golden calf? Listen, we're not done yet. Listen, verse four, and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Therefore, Aaron made the molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. We're going to sacrifice to this animal. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And so the danger is that you and I, in our impatience, will look for our own solution. And oftentimes that will involve us counting on some idol. You go, I've never done that. You know, I had anything to do with an idol. No, but have you put something else or someone else in place of God? Where I have this moment where I need to trust God. But because of my impatience, I come up with my own solution. And I'm trusting in my own thing that I'm going to do or I'm trusting in this other person because God's obviously not listening. So I just need to go on and ask these other people. I can remember years and years and years ago, I was supposed to move to, uh, or I'm sorry, I had the opportunity to move to Seattle, Washington. Nirvana. <laughs> Let's go. Mid-90s. I'm down. And I was ready to go. And I can remember I had prayed, but God wasn't answering. Hmm, that's weird, because I know he wants me to go, but he's not answering me. So what I did was I began to ask co-workers, hey, uh, so I have this opportunity and this opportunity. What do you think that I should do? And every time I asked somebody, I got a different answer. I began to ask people at church, other Christians, hey, what, 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 do you, what do you think I should do? I have this opportunity. What I was doing was God wasn't answering me, or maybe he was. Maybe he was saying, nah, fool, you ain't going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not, I'm not going to bother, not gonna bother with that. No, I'm not answering. But my thought was, well, I really want to do it, so i gotta, I got to ask people, because I can't count on God, so i got to ask other people until they give me the right answer that I want to hear. Until finally in a Bible study on a Wednesday night in a tiny little church smaller than this room, I was sitting there and all of a sudden God spoke to me and said, no, nah, fool, you ain't going to Seattle. Ah. But I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson that when I grow impatient, oftentimes I can appoint some other idol. I turn to someone else and like, what do you think? And what do you think? And what do you think? And what do you think? When all the time I just needed just Wait. God's going to answer. You asked him a question, he'll answer. These people did not wait. They said, make us a golden calf. Aaron does it, and then he sets up this altar, and they say, hey, tomorrow this is what we're going to do. So in verse 5, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So these people are all about it. We've got our idol. We've got our leader. I mean, just that fast, they're willing to give up all that God has done for them, all that they've seen, all that they have experienced. Ah, uh, but I can oftentimes find myself doing that same thing, getting angry at somebody, somebody that I love, somebody that I know, somebody that I've loved, somebody that I've known for a long time. I know that none of you would ever do this, so I explained to you from my own example, oftentimes I can find myself getting angry at someone and in an instant, because something didn't happen the way that I wanted it to, I get angry at that individual and I forget all of the good things that they've done for me. I can remember years ago, years ago, it was in the 1900s when I was a teenager. 
and I had a job, man. Oh, you know what that's like, right? I had a job, making money. I go to the mall, buy my own clothes. And I was doing that. Had a little bit of gas money. Go out to the movies, hang out. Like, oh man, living is just, I got money, man. It's just making it rain. And I remember one night standing with my dad in the kitchen, a tiny little kitchen. The kitchen, by the way, was in his house because I didn't have my own house, okay? It's important for the story. And we're standing there at the counter, which happened to be his counter in his kitchen in his house. And he was talking to me about money, about the way that I was handling my money. And I got angry. Pulled some money out from my fat wad, right? Because when you're not making that much money, you don't put it in the bank. You just carry it around with you because that way it makes you feel like, oh, I got lots of money. And I took some money and I threw it on the counter. I said, there's your money. And I walked over to my room, which just happened to be the room that he was letting me use in his house. And I went into my room and immediately he came in and he closed the door. Yeah. And he reminded me, he didn't, he didn't yell. That was like the scariest part of the whole thing. He didn't yell. He just reminded me that I was in a room that he was letting me use inside of his house. And that in an instant, I had forgotten because I was angry at him. I forgot that, oh, wait, he, he pays the electricity bill and the water and the trash. And even if I mow the lawn, he paid for the lawnmower and the gas. And, and, and uh, I had forgotten that he had given me life and that he was ready to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten all of those things, all of the goodness that he had shown me for many, many, coaching my little league teams, coaching my soccer team. I'd forgotten all of that. And in a, in a, in a way, it was like, you know what? Screw you, buddy, because you know what? Uh, you ain't done nothing for me, is, is what I was doing in my actions. Because I got impatient, I got angry, and forgot all of the goodness that he had shown me. And when he came into my room, he didn't say, hey, we've been good to you, and I've done this. And I, He didn't go down a list of, you know, the 200 things that he's done for me. Since the day that you were born, let me just, you know, number one, you know, he didn't do that. He just came in. It was a very quick conversation. But in an instant, I was reminded of all of the goodness that he had shown me over the years. And I said, I am sorry. Please don't kill me. We can oftentimes find ourselves in that same position. These people find themselves in that type of a situation with their father, God. We don't care that we were in slavery and that you saved us. We were slaves. Forgot all about that. The plagues, pff, who cares? You split the Red Sea open and got us through safely and then killed all of our enemies, pff, who cares? You fed us in the wilderness, who cares? Gave us water, who cares? Gave us safety, who cares? And in an instant, they traded all that in, forget all of that, because we're impatient and we need some answers right now. We need a leader, and let's make our own leader. So very guilty. And because of that, they will experience God's wrath, which is something that we do not often consider in here, because God is so loving and we talk about that as often as we can. But he is a God of wrath, which we'll see in the remaining verses, beginning at verse 7. But let me read something to you first. Wrath is used with reference to both God and people. When used of God, it is to be understood that there is the complete absence of that fickleness and immoral quality so prominent in the anger attributed to the gods of the heathen and to people. You know what fickleness is? Anybody know what fickleness is? Sounds wrong. Sounds wrong? It does. <laughs> All right. Did you go to uh, um, fickleness is like a constant changing. Like you never have your mind set on one thing. You're yeah. constantly being like, oh, I like that card. Never mind. That's yeah. not my dream card. This is my dream card. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. Or, man, I really love those shoes. No, I don't. I hate those shoes. 
or it's, it's just back and forth. It's just fluctuating all the time. I can't make up my mind. I just, one day this is good and one day it's bad. I don't really know where I'm at. God's wrath, that, that's you and I. When we get angry, we're back and forth. We flip-flop. And I'm angry, but I know I shouldn't be angry, but I'm angry. And we're back and forth. With God, there is no fickleness. He says this, the divine wrath is to be regarded as the natural expression of the divine nature is absolute holiness manifesting itself against the willful high-handed deliberate inexcusable sin and iniquity of mankind we're deliberately sinful so god's wrath deals with that god's wrath is always regarded in the scripture as the just proper and natural expression of his holiness and righteousness, which must always, under all circumstances and at all costs, be maintained. In other words, he can be, um, uh, he can, he can show his wrath and his righteousness at the same time. It is therefore a righteous indignation, a righteous anger, and compatible with the holy and righteous nature of God. The element of love and compassion is always closely connected with God's anger. If we rightly estimate the divine anger, we must unhesitatingly pronounce it to be but the expression and measure of that love. How can God be wrathful and yet loving? The Bible says that God is love. So how can that be? It's kind of like when a parent is disciplining their child and they break something. Like if like my little brother would have break the face, nothing would probably happen to him. Because he gets off scot-free every time. What? Evil. Exactly. Evil but, little um, brothers and sisters. When I was a kid, if I like... Uh, I was always getting in the house and I smashed into my grandma's wardrobe, right? I got my butt whooped and then I got put in the corner I said, and they told me, don't do that again. Okay. So, you experienced their wrath and why is that? Because they love me. And how does that how does that work out? What do you mean they love you so they they disciplined you? What is that? If they, did, if they didn't love me, then they would just let me do what I want. If they loved me, then they would correct me and like, the Bible says that make a, make a child has to stray and they will never stray from it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Because if you don't learn in that moment, that, hey, you ought not be roller skating in the house and smashing into things. Then what will happen is you'll continue to do that. And you will think that it is normal. And then one day, because love is blind, someone will marry you. And then you'll come roller skating through and you'll break their furniture. And they'll say, get out. Verse 7. Verse 7 in God's wrath, we see that, first of all, the revealing of the sin must take place. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down. Now listen to the language here. I love the language. Verse 7, God speaking to Moses, He says to Moses, Go get down, for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They're involved in idolatry down there. Partying. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. You know what he said? He said, they've done wrong. They, your people disobeyed what I told them to do. Verse 8. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So God reveals the sin to Moses. This is what they've done wrong. Now, what happens here, this is the first of two parts at this point where Moses begins to reason with God, and I love this section, verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. So they were sinful people, and they were stiff-necked. Anyone other than Noah know what stiff-necked means? What is it? <laughs> Stubborn. What? None of you would ever do this, but you have siblings who have done this. Where your parents say, hey, you better look at me. And they go, I'm not going to look at you. They're putting up their fight like, oh, I'm stiff-necked. I'm not turning my neck. And they say, get over here. No, I'm not going over there. Stiff-necked people. They're stubborn people. In verse 10, God continues to speak to Moses and says, now, therefore, let me alone. Leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation 
He tells Moses, listen, let me just kill them all, and then we'll just start a brand new nation with you, Moses. Now, for the majority of us, we'd have been like, yeah, that sounds good. Because yeah. 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 Ju- what the world needs is a million of me, right? Oh, man. Well, it'd be easier. We could admit that. We have the most trouble dealing with ourselves. That would be horrible. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Remember I told you a moment ago to pay attention to the language? Whose people are these? Because because God said to Moses, look at your people down there. The people that you brought out of Egypt. But did you see what Moses just said in verse 11? Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? They're throwing these people back and forth like, these are not my people, these are your people. No, they're not, they're your people. Can you imagine God like, who brought them out of Egypt? Right, Moses is like, well, you did it. God's like, did you see me? <laughs> you were there. You know, you were like, and they're just like back and forth. Like, well, these are your people. No, they're not. They're your people. Why is all this going on? It, it sounds so odd for us to think about God, you know, just casting off the people. And we'll talk about that in just a moment before we leave this section. But it goes on in verse 12 to say, why God is, uh, Moses is speaking to God. He's reasoning with him. Why should the Egyptians speak? And say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. God, let them go. Verse 13, he continues on and reminds God of the promises that he had made previously. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's Jacob. Your servants to whom you swore... By your own self, God, you swore by your own self. And you said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants. And they shall inherit it forever. He says, God, you made these promises, remember? Don't forget. And in verse 14, we read a verse that is so odd, so strange. Because it says in verse 14, so the Lord relented. Some of your translations may say that he repented. And you're like, repent? That's like when you sin and you turn away and you, you don't. And it, what does that mean that he relented or he repented from the harm which he said he would do to his people? It means that he at that point said, okay, I will not, I will not do what I, was, what I said I was going to do. Or, or what I was telling Moses, hey, hey, Moses, how about I wipe all these people out? God says, okay, I will not do that. Now, in order to understand this, or at least, now let me, let me say this. Let me preface what I'm about to say by saying this. This is my own theory. Because it doesn't tell us exactly why God said such and such and why Moses said such. So this is my theory on the whole thing. Because I really, as I look at the entire Bible, I do not think that God is saying, I'm done with these people. And this is not the last time it's going to happen. But in order to understand this, or at least for me to understand it, I go back to Moses' childhood. Where did Moses, where was he born? Where did he grow up? Where was he at? Does anybody remember? Egypt. And then he ended up in Midian, and that's where God spoke to him. But, but why did he leave Egypt? Does anybody else remember why he left Egypt? Anybody? Yes. Because he killed someone. Who did he kill? Not the, brother. not the Pharaoh's son, but Nico. Uh, wasn't one of the guards that was beating one of the slaves or something? It was an Egyptian guard or taskmaster, slave master. And he was beating a Hebrew slave. And Moses got out there and he looked over this way and he looked over that way and he grabbed that guard, killed him, and buried him in the sand. And then Pharaoh found out about it. And he put up a wanted poster. They were in all of the postal service offices and said, we're looking for this guy, Moshe. We want to kill him. So Moses had to skip town. Now, many years later, we get to this episode, 
And God says, let's kill some people. And Moses, the murderer from his past life, may have said, all right, let's do it. I've done it. Let's do it, God. But now, many years later, his heart has learned to be merciful, to plead on people's behalf rather than to kill them. He's no longer taking the matter into his own hand and saying, let's just do it. Let's just kill him right now. I'll help you out. But he says, listen, God, be patient with these people. Be merciful. God, I believe, is working through this scenario with Moses in order to continue to develop Moses into a great leader. Now, Moses is already a great leader, but God is going to continue to develop him into an even greater leader. And he wants for Moses to not just not just immediately say, okay, that's it, wipe them all out, but to say, wait a minute, wait, 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 be merciful with the people. And that's exactly where the heart of Moses is. We see that through this difficulty, the heart of Moses is revealed. Through this difficulty, we see that the heart of the people is a disobedience. But through this difficulty, this challenge, we see that the heart of Moses has grown, that it has become merciful, that it has grown patient. We oftentimes do not understand we plant a seed in the ground, pumpkin or sunflower or corn, and you're waiting for that thing, and it's like it's in the dirt, it's got water, there's sunshine. What's the problem? We do not understand that below the surface, roots are growing. We could not see that until a plant begins to sprout forth. And we say, oh, there's leaves. And then it continues to grow into a plant. We did not understand that the entire time that we were waiting so impatiently, that something was happening under the surface. And so oftentimes you and I do not understand. We're calling out to God like, where are you at? And why don't you see this? And why don't you do something about it? And we do not understand that the entire time under the surface, God was already working. That things were growing, being put into place. That God was orchestrating already. And that the fruit hasn't come yet, but it's on the way. All of these many years, God has been working in the heart of Moses, underground, so to speak, under the surface. Until we see Moses go from murder to merciful. And you may feel as if, you know what, God, I don't know, I'm just not really changing. And you might get discouraged and just get so down on yourself and like, man, I, I just don't, I don't even see God working in me. I don't see anything changing. I'm just sinful. I keep messing with this stuff. And I just don't know if there's any hope, not realizing that the entire time, that the entire time, God is working under the surface, changing, arranging. Roots growing deeper. He had been doing that in Moses' life, and it becomes evident here. And so when it says that, you know, God's, well, you know, I'm going to kill the, let's just kill the people. And then, and then it says that the Lord relented. I think what God is doing is he's using this as a training session for Moses. But now there is the return to the camp. We're still in this section on the God of wrath, but now comes returning to camp. And in verse 15, it says, and Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, both sides. Now, on the, uh, the, I, I've never seen pictures of it like that, huh? But it's written on both sides, on the one side and on the other, they were written. Now, the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, now you're going, Joshua, wait, where did he come from? You may remember that Moses had gone up. He had come back down, and then God said, hey, come back up, but I want you to bring Joshua with you. And so Joshua went up. I don't know all that Joshua experienced up on the mountain, whether he got to experience all that Moses did. But nevertheless, as they're making their way down, Joshua is with him, and he hears the noise of the party below. The worship of the calf, the partying, the eating, the drinking, the dancing, whatever's going on down there. And Joshua, verse 17, now when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he, that's Moses in verse 18, said, it is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. 
So Moses' anger became hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Ouch. And what happens in verse 20 is the rebuking of the people. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Bitterness. Like, this is what your lifestyle, your, your, your idolatrous lifestyle will end in bitterness. Knock it off is what he's saying in verse 21. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Now check this out. Look what Aaron does. Let me ask you a question real quick. Who made the calf? Aaron. Yes. Verse 22. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people. They are set on evil. Right at that moment, there was a bus coming by, and Aaron just threw all the people underneath it. Verse 23, for they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, in verse 24, Who have, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. <laughs> like a... I don't know, I just threw the gold in the fire and this calf jumped out. Lying through his teeth to his brother Moses. He's caught. Got nothing to say, so he comes up with this lame excuse. And then finally, in verse 25, we see a reckoning. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, it was Aaron's job. You had one job. I was going up on the mountain to meet with God. I left you with this responsibility. I know none of you have ever experienced this before, so I'll share from my own experience. But a parent says to the oldest, hey, we're taking off, going out for the night. You're, you babysit the kids, your brothers and sisters, and you know we'll be back. Make sure that nothing had wrong, you know, goes wrong or anything. They get back, they find something broken, something missing, some window broken, somebody's hurt, whatever it might be. Same thing here, like Aaron, you were supposed to be watching the people. And instead of the leader leading the people, the people were leading the leader. It's the wrong way around. So in verse 26, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi Vela gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Let, this is Moses speaking. Let every man put his sword on his side. So all these sons of Levi come to Moses. And Moses says, all of you put your sword on. Bring your belt with your sword. And in verse 27, go in and out from entrance to entrance, from one side of the camp to the other side, throughout the camp, and let every man, some of you are not going to like this, let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. This is one of those passages that causes the critics to say, wait a minute. You say God is loving. But then look at Exodus 32, and why is he having people killed, and why would he slaughter the people like this? And then we go, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know why he would do that. So let me ask you a question. Let's work to it, through it together right now, you and I. Why would God instruct Moses to do this? Nathan? Instantly, my thought goes to every single time that there's judgment, there's always a choice. They chose wrong. They had a feeling. Something tells me that they knew what was going to happen, you know. They had the choice. He said, it's either me or not me. They said, not me. Well, you said, not me. I gave you the choice. You totally could have said me, but now you die. Okay. 
Yeah, Plain and simple. It was a free choice. <laughs> it was a free choice. It absolutely was. Nobody forced them to do it. Right? Nobody forced them to do it. Even Aaron was not forced. They said, hey, make us a gold. Okay, well, bring me the, bring me the gold. No. Okay. That's all right. Anybody else? You good with Nathan's answer? Is that good enough for you? Are you, you all right with that? Well, you know, they had a choice. So, I mean, they chose wrong, so they died. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's what happened. They did choose wrong. And they experienced death. But but why? Is this is this consistent with a God that's loving? I'm asking you the question. I will never be a college professor. But let's say I'm a college professor. And you in a year or two, you're in some college, and some professor says, You're a Christian? You think God is loving? Exodus 32. All kinds of people died, 3,000 men. So how do you justify that? God's loving or he's vengeful? Which is it? He's just. Meaning what? Explain for us. God's not going to punish someone for something that's not wrong. If he, because God loves us. It's when they chose to do wrong, they chose sin over God. Yes. And so when sin puts someone to death, it's kind of like a literal tense right there because they chose to worship an idol when they Okay. So good answers. Those good enough for you? Everybody else? You all right with that? Yeah? 3,000 people died. 3,000. That's a lot of people. 3,000. What's that? You can add something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're going to be judged in the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody will. Yep. Um, so, I mean, you can easily relate that. I mean, we think 3,000 is a lot, but I mean, think of the millions and millions of people today that choose to not be for God that will be uh, judged in the future. Yes. Yeah. And the 3,000, how many people were in the camp? It's estimated that there were millions in the camp. So 3,000 relatively speaking, was, was a small number of the people. It's hard for us to, 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 to rectify this, to justify and to say, well, God is loving, but he's also wrathful. And I, how, did the, how, did the two, how can the two be from the same God? And it's hard for you and I because we're not that way. It's hard for us to be loving and wrathful. Normally, we're just wrathful. And then afterwards, we're loving. And God does the same at the, at the same, does both at the same time. I, I can give you this example. You've got a pain in your shoulder or in your side. And you go to the doctor. And they look, they run tests, tests come back, and the tests reveal that you've got cancer. And you say to the doctor, get it out. Let's go. And the doctor says, well, hold on. That cancer has the right to live. And the cancer is actually surviving off of your body, and it just seems so mean to get rid of it. I mean, if we take it out, it's going to die. So let's just leave it in. What do you do? <laughs> Second opinion, new doctor. And you try to get that doctor's license taken away. Because the most loving thing that the doctor can do is to cut you open and remove what is poisonous there. That's loving. Works the same way for parents. And obviously with God. In order to protect the majority of the people that were there, God allowed this judgment through the hand of Moses and the, the hands of Le the sons of Levi to take place. Many do not like it. They do not, they cannot, they cannot figure out the, how, to, how can the two be from the same God? I, I don't really understand. But that is because we do not, we're, we're not all loving like God is. And we can't be we can't always be all loving and then at the same time wrathful, but God can. God can. 
He's just. He cares about you and I. And so at times, there are smaller portions removed in order that the larger amount might continue on and continue to grow. So finally, in verse 30, the second part of reasoning with God, part two. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have created, uh, committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. God already knew that. Moses is agreeing with him, confessing. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, Moses says, blot me out of your book which you have written on. This is the first time that we hear about some book being written that God wrote. And so in verse 32, he says, listen, if, if, you're, if you're going, or rather verse 33, if you're going to blot them out of your book, just go ahead and blot me out. Just kill me too, God. I don't want to be alive if you're going to take all of them. And the Lord said to Moses, God, this time God says, we're not going with your plan. Because in verse 33, and the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, therefore, go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. This is a lesson. Sin will be punished, he tells them. And in verse 35, so the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. God does judge. And it is for our best. There are times when God will remove something from my life that may be in the moment I'm enjoying, but God knows that in the long run it is going to harm me and that it must be uprooted. In the moment I do not like it, it hurts. Why would God take those things from me? I was having a good time with that. But God knows in the long run, this is not going to be profitable for you. In fact, it is going to be harmful. And so he will oftentimes take things, remove things from our lives because he loves us so. It may be hard to understand. We may think of it in terms of a parent. Hopefully you trust your parents. It may be that they remove something from your life. Give me your phone. No, you can't play your video games. Whatever it might be, something small, something big, but they take it from you because of some, some behavior that you have exhibited that's wrong. And they remove it from you, and in the moment you do not like it. But perhaps after, and hopefully, you see, you know what, I did do something wrong, and it was, it was best for me to lose that thing, to lose that small thing in order to save the larger. Father, we are so very thankful for you.